Well, good morning, everyone. Andrew and I here, uh, and we are going to be going through Revelation chapter 3 with you in these daily encouragements. Um, I hope you're reading. Um, it is just a fantastic book with a great message. And so, Andrew, I'll just uh, kind of start asking your thoughts on Revelation chapter 3. Yeah, so uh, the letters to the churches continue. So uh, Jesus continues his message to these individual churches. And uh, <clears throat> I think the thing that stood out to me the most in chapter three was uh, this idea of externally, you may seem good or be flourishing, but spiritually, internally, there's a hidden reality that you're actually, um, well, he says naked and uh, pitiful and wretched. So we see this first in the church in Sardis, uh, where Jesus says in verse one, I know your works, you have the reputation of being alive, uh, but you are dead. And then he says something very similar and a little more provocative to Laodicea in verse 17, where Jesus says, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And then he says, you need to come to me to be truly rich, uh, to find true clothing and so that you can see. And so I was just struck by this idea, this, this contrast that can exist in our lives that uh, externally we may be flourishing um, in many ways, but internally we can be uh, very far away from Christ. And so um, these words are, are very challenging. And then of course he calls, he calls the church, especially in Laodicea uh, to repent and to turn back to him. So that's what, that's what stood out to me uh, when I was reading this in chapter three. Yeah. Um, for me, very similar uh, thought. Um, I was looking at Sardis and yeah, it's, it's amazing that you can have this appearance of actually being um, busy, like, wow, that church is thriving. That church has it going on, but inwardly they're just dead. And, um, and of course, uh, Jesus is calling them to repent. They've actually soiled their clothing. And yet he says there are a few that haven't soiled their clothes yet. And so there are a few that are faithful, um, who are walking in purity. Um, but it's, it's, it's just, it, it, it almost came across as if he's addressing a church that really is just kind of have this a dualistic mindset. We, we put, we pretend we're, we're one way on the outside, but uh, inwardly we don't pay attention to our own walk and uh, relationship with Jesus. And then when you get to Laodicea, it's, it's like, you're neither hot nor cold. You're not against me but you're not really for me. There's no zealousness that's, that's there. It's just apathy. And I was thinking about how easy um, it is to have apathy creep, you know, where we are so self-sufficient, especially, I, I think Laodicea is a good description uh, oftentimes of um, our churches here in uh, America. And, and the reason I say that is because we we really are the people have, who have means. We we have wealth. We have we. There's a certain lifestyle that we're accustomed to and we're comfortable with. And it's so easy for us to have apathy creep because creep because we are self sufficient, incredibly self sufficient, um, and and that blinds us to our actual need, like you said, or. Yeah. Uh, our, our, our needs can only be met through Christ. And, um, and, and yet we, we struggle with that. Yeah. I was, I was just looking at a little bit of the background to revelation and it's, it's hard to know what exactly was going on when John wrote this. Uh, but I was reading just one person who was basically saying that it probably wasn't a time of, intense persecution. What, what John might be more concerned about is that uh, the church is just kind of getting used to Roman culture 
and just kind of caving into it over time. And so what he's fighting against is not so much to be faithful in the midst of intense persecution from the government, but to be faithful in the midst of a overwhelming oppressive cultural influence that might not be, uh, it might not be intense persecution, but it is clearly contrary to the gospel. And just by living in that culture, you're going to be deceived by that. And so that, that made a lot of sense to me in terms of how we apply this today, that we live in a culture that is so, uh, uh, anti-Christian in, in so many ways. And, and I think, although we don't suffer, uh, clear state sponsored persecution, these are important warnings for us to where we can, we can, as you were saying, grow apathetic to the urgency of the message of the gospel and just say, well, I've got food and clothing and a good job, and I'm just going to kind of go about my business and also add Jesus on top of all those things. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess for me, you know, obviously I don't want to lose those things, but at the same time, I need to be aware that I may be poor and uh, naked and not even, not even realize it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like um, what Jesus says to Laodicea <clears throat> is that he says, uh, he says, he doesn't just tell them to repent. He says, be zealous and repent. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, it's like, come on, guys, get out of this rut of, of I know you're not against me, but you're not really for me. <laughs> you know, you're yeah. not, you're not zealous um, for uh, the the glory of God. And, and so, I mean, that was a uh, for, for me, anyway, as I'm applying it to my own uh, life, it's like, all right, how do I keep from apathy creep in my life? How do I keep from apathy creep? And, and, and I wrote down a few things. You might have some thoughts as well. But um, one of the things, the first thing I wrote down is I, gotta, I, I have to be intentional about not forgetting uh, uh, who I am uh, apart from Christ and who I am in Christ that my my identity is is rooted in him apart from him i am naked blind and wretched and 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 all of those things and 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 i think this is where really corporate worship comes into to play as well the i think the daily disciplines all those work together to help remind me of who i am mm-hmm. well and just just to add to that um who who i am what the implication that i see in in verses 17 18, 19 is when I am content with physical wealth or physical clothing, Jesus, uh, Jesus doesn't call me to give those things up necessarily. What he says is seek greater wealth, seek greater clothing, seek greater uh, provision in me. And so, so I, yeah, when it comes to like, how do I get rid of apathy? What my problem is not that I, uh, it's not so much that I'm choosing other things over Jesus is that I'm not seeking a greater wealth. I'm not seeking something greater that Jesus provides, which the physical can distract from. Mm-hmm. I, and that, that doesn't mean the physical is bad, but it just, it just means that I can find contentment in things that won't really ultimately provide contentment. I need to remind myself of my identity in Jesus, what he, what he provides me that is far greater than what the world provides. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the spiritual disciplines that that we can foster in our lives that really help us uh, fight against apathy creep is uh, it, it's just prayer. Be- here's why. Prayer is the most tangible expression that we have as humans to express our dependence and need for God. Hmm. Um, and, and yet it is such a difficult discipline to develop in our, in our lives. Um, and I'm not talking about just praying at the, the dinner t- table. Um, I'm talking about falling on our faces before God and expressing our, our needs to him and finding our contentment um, in him through that discipline. Um, I, it, it's such an important discipline and yet why is it so hard <laughs> to really develop that in our, in our lives? Uh, I've read things over and over how, um, and it's not just, uh, 
it, it's it's the experience of so many people that I have read over the years that it's just almost baffling. Why why is prayer so hard to develop in our lives? It's, it would seem so easy to do. Well, it, it's it's kind of like what you said. I mean, if it's a sign of your dependence, but our problem is our self sufficiency, it would yeah. make sense that we wouldn't that we wouldn't pray. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So. And uh, so to contrast those two churches um, with right in the middle, you have Philadelphia, who is just commended for their perseverance, um, their patient endurance. And uh, of course, Jesus tells them just to continue to hold fast, even in the midst of um, what he would call what he calls the synagogue of Satan. Um, In other words, perseverance, this patient endurance, their faithfulness comes at um, at, at a cost, it's hard. Um, and, and so faithfulness is not something that just, Oh, okay. Yeah. It just naturally happens. No, there's, it's hard. Sometimes it, 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 it causes us to patiently endure. It causes us to exercise perseverance, um, to be faithful and they were commended for it. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's only two churches in all these letters that, um, Jesus doesn't say anything negative about uh, in terms of them calling them to repent. And man, I, F, I would love FBC to be a church like that, right? Where, <laughs> where God just looks at it and says, man, you guys are doing, you're doing the right things. You're, you're being faithful to me. And, uh, and so hold fast to that, you know? Um, but of, of course, um, like any church where we have people and I mean myself, <laughs> right? Well, I, I need Jesus just as much as anybody. Um, and, uh, I, I struggle just as much as anybody. Hmm. And so it, it, this is, but yeah, I still long for, all right, I just want to be a Philadelphia. <laughs> hmm. Well, yeah, that, I hadn't really thought about this, but that just kind of brings to mind, uh, I think maybe something that we easily miss when we read this, but these are, these are letters to churches, right? So it's uh, it's very easy for us to take like an individualized application approach to it. But um, this is really a call to the whole church to repent together, to hold fast together, um, to endure together. And so uh, I, I, as we look at these churches, it's it's a reminder that we are we are totally in this together. To some extent, we fall together or we rise together or we endure together. Um, and so that's kind of an aside, but it was just, as you were talking, it made me realize something that like, yeah, these are to churches. They would have been hearing these letters read out loud to the whole congregation. And so they're commended together and they're also um, criticized together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. For sure. For sure. Well, we hope that, um, this particular chapter is helpful to you as you process um, what kind of believer you're going to uh, to be in the sense of your faithfulness. What where are you at in terms of faithfulness? And to realize that, that there is a corporate aspect to this, right? It's not just you as an individual. It's you're a part of you're a part of a body. You're part of um, a, a a group of believers who make up this beautiful thing called the church. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and that matters. So I would just uh, challenge you to um, think about your faithfulness and uh, maybe even um, evaluate apathy creep in your own life and how you can um, steer away from that. So, well, let's, uh, let's pray together and we'll get off this thing. <laughs> Father, um, I'm reminded in this particular chapter that Apart from you, uh, we are wretched, poor, and blind. Uh, Father, help us not to forget our, our need for you. Help us to pursue you. Help us to follow you and be faithful to you and find our contentment in you. Help us to be zealous for you. Help us to um, be people of integrity who don't just put a show on the outside for people to see, but inwardly we are uh, pursuing godliness and, uh, 
and, and genuinely wanting to um, obey you, not to win your love, uh, but to respond to your great love in our lives. So Father, help us. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Uh, that's all. <laughs> God bless.